Come on, somebody, put your hands together. Oh, if I were you, I'd just go ahead and put my hands together. If I were you. I, if I was at my house, I'd put my hands together. If I was in my bedroom, in my pajamas on, I'd put my hands together. I, I'd do it. I would do it. I would do it. Because some of us know what it's like to be other places, and you wish you could put your hands together. My grandmother died in a comatose state, two and a half years laid motionless. Motionless. You think about that. The woman I used to see praise, the woman I used to see worship, I used to see her clap her hands, and well, I grew up in an old Baptist church, so if she got started feeling the Holy Ghost, they would come and put her, put, they, you know, the ushers would come and sit on her almost, you know, and fan her down, you know what I mean? Uh, so it was interesting to see the progression in life to where all of a sudden she was there in a nursing home, uh, completely motionless. The only thing she could do was blink, and she could smile every now and then to let you know that she sees you or, or she hears you. And I thought about life and the, the ebbs and the flows of life and how you get to a point that you would never foresee coming. She never saw that coming. As a young woman, she never saw. She never thought that her last two and a half years on, the, on this earth would be laying motionless on her back with a feeding tube down her throat. You don't think about that. You just don't. We don't, we don't have the type of capacity to think that far down the road of what this might look like at the end. And I better take advantage of everything that I have right now. That I can't wait. I can't be in a position where I'm thinking like, you know, I'm always going to have this mobility. I'm always have these faculties. I'm always have the ability to go in and come out, to stand, to do, to sing, to shout, to clap my hands. And I don't know what she would have given. I got my ideas. I got my ideas of what she might have given. I don't know what she would have given to be able to just say, thank you, Jesus. I don't know what she would have been able to give to just clap her hands. I don't know what she would have been able to give. I don't know what she would have offered to God. If she could have offered it, if she probably offered, she probably was in her mind pleading and praying with God to, to come out of this state so that she could just give him one more round of worship, one more round of praise. And then sometimes I think about myself. I hope you think about yourself. How sometimes we can get into a place to where, oh, I've heard that song before. Oh my goodness, Lord. I've heard that song before. Or I'm in my living room and I don't want to praise. I'm in my kitchen. Or I'm in my bedroom. I'm wearing my pajamas. Well, I'm in a place to where I don't really feel like praising. You don't know how this is all going to end. You don't know how it's going to end. I don't know how it's going to end. And so I feel like I should share with you that you should take full advantage. I've seen her lying there two and a half years without being able to take care of herself. That is a, a nasty position to be in. And I thank God that I got a chance to see her praise. I got a chance to see her praise. How many people need to see you praise? You got kids. You got loved ones. Ain't nobody ever seen you lift your hands not one time. Ain't nobody ever seen a tear come down your face. Ain't nobody ever seen you clap your hands. Ain't nobody ever, ever heard you even whisper, thank you, Jesus. That is a problem for us. Because you don't know how this is going to end. You don't know how much time you got or how much you don't have. I don't know how long, 11 and a half years of pastoring this church. I don't know how many times I've sat here on a Sunday morning. I've looked at people in their face. They worshiped with me. And then the Monday following, they were dead. It happens. It happens. It can happen to me. It can happen to anybody else. Is there anybody in the room? It can happen to anybody, regardless of age, regardless of ability. It can happen to anybody. Anything can happen to anybody at any time. Your life could change. So what I'm telling you is what you sometimes can get complacent with is an opportunity for you to really dive in and lean in close to the things that you think are small and insignificant. It's just too small for me to really get. When the big thing comes, I'll really be ready. No, 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 don't lie to yourself. I've lied to myself the same way. Why am I on this? The Holy Spirit wants me to remind you something, that you need to be focused on the things that sometimes you feel like is too embarrassing, it's too uncomfortable, I don't want to do that, because you never know when the thing that you felt like you, do, you would diminish will become the most powerful thing, the most important thing in your entire life. Just being able to put your hands together, lift your hand and say, God, I thank you. I thank you. Now somebody, come on, let us, I can't say that much without giving you an opportunity. <laughs> an opportunity to say, Lord, I thank you. You're worthy. You're worthy of all glory, honor, and praise. I lift my voice to you. I lift my hands to you, and I say thank you. God, I, I don't have much to offer. You know my life. I am not that good. I'm not that bright. I'm, I'm all jacked up in the inside. But, Lord, can you receive this word? Thank you. 
I just thank you. Right here where my kids can hear me. Right here where my wife can hear me. Right here where, where those who don't even know that I'm watching you, they can hear me. God, I just thank you. You're worthy. Even now in my living room, we always talk about it as preachers. I praise him right in my car, but we don't really do that. You, you talk about praising him in the kitchen. You don't do that. Praise him in the living room. You don't do that. So now when we really elevate it, you say, well, you know, I'm just kind of nervous. Listen, I'm telling you, Bessie Mae Reynolds laid two and a half years on her back with people washing her body, not being able to bring a spoon to her mouth, Chop, chapped and parched lips because she was breathing out of her mouth. I'm telling you, this would be a good time for you to worship, a good time for you to worship right now. <laughs> Welcome to Many Place. So glad you're here. So glad you're here as we transition today. I'm excited. Uh, my name is Dion Gates. I'm the pastor here. So excited that you're here with us. Listen, if you're a first-time guest, we're grateful for you. Excited that you're here with us. You're not here by mistake. Uh, let us know. We just want to see how many people are logging in, how many people are getting a chance to be a part of this experience with us. Uh, I feel like God's got something for you today. Uh, I love, I love uh, kind of getting the, the opportunity to do sandwich series, things that are right in the middle. We're, we're done with faith, hope, and, and love. We're moving right now into this middle portion where it's kind of like ambiguous for some of you, but God knows what he's doing. I'm going to be talking specifically today about transition because we are transitioning. This is the last weekend, the last Sunday. You've had 51 of them. This is the 52nd. This is what, what are you going to do now with this 52nd one as we close out 2020 and go into 2021? I love the idea of closing out 2020, but you know what? I feel like 2020 has got some blessing in it, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I feel like the guy said, you know what? You better talk about my blessings in 2020. I said, yeah, I'm going to have to talk about the blessings in 2020, Lord, because I felt like that some people would want to hurry up and escape it. You know, Phew, let me get out of this bad boy. You already got your party plans, what you're going to be drinking on New Year's Eve and everything. Oh, oops. No, not y'all. Not y'all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I'm talking I'm talking about you. I know the type of people that go to church here. <laughs> Yes, yeah, I know the type of people that go to church here. What I'm saying to you is that God said, don't you dare think that 2020 was a mistake. Don't you think it was a mistake? Because if you think it was a mistake, then you won't even run from it. But how you exit one season determines how you enter another. Oh, you need to know that. You didn't know that. You didn't know that. So you're in a hurry to get out of something that you really didn't fully learn something in. Anytime I'm, hurry, I'm in a hurry to get out of a classroom, guess what ends up happening? I got to retake the class. I'm in a hurry to get out. I'm in a hurry to get out. I wish they would hurry up and be quiet so I can get out of here. Every time I've been a student and I've behaved that way, I, it, it just, it, listen, it always came back to bite me. I eventually had to come back around and retake something every time. And this is the thing that I don't want you to miss what 2020 really offered. It was a great classroom. It was a phenomenal teacher. And can I tell you the lessons that have been started in 2020 are not finished. They're just going to continue on until 2021. I love the fact that the new year, January 1, when it rolls over at midnight, we all celebrate, kiss each other, whatever. Some of you may be sleeping, snoring because you're too old to stay up that late. Whatever it is, whatever it is, when it comes to an end, you think that magically when you wake up and the calendar reads 1-1-2021, that it's going to be good and everything's changed. No, it's not. And that's not anything that we should look bad on or we should be down on. All I'm saying is that there's some things that start, but they don't end just on the calendar year. So something has started. God starts things all the time. But what I've learned about God is that he's able to finish the things that he starts. So it's not done yet. There's still racial tension. There's still political divide and discourse. There's still fear of end times. There's still virus in people's bodies. So it doesn't come to an end. So, Pastor, what exactly do you, are you telling me? What are you saying about this whole idea that things have to change, but at the same time we can celebrate what was in 2020? I know many of you lost things. You're not, you, you didn't come out of this unscathed. You lost something. You had to deal with something that you wouldn't expect to deal with. There was tension somewhere in a conversation or relationship Something happened for you differently, and we tried to do our very best to make, uh, make things normal and go on down the road with a normalcy, but it's not the exact same. Things are different, right? And it's okay for, them to, for us to acknowledge the difference that is. Uh, I think it's important for us to acknowledge it because if we don't acknowledge what has been, then we will, we will inevitably continue to make the same mistakes. 
let me just give you an example of this, some mistakes that I, I'm challenged with making, remaking the same mistake. My calendar was cleared. I got an opportunity to prioritize and think about what was really important, eliminate some fluff, things that were just distractionary, busy work for the sake of busy work, and then I got a chance to focus on what was really important to eventually start filling my calendar back up. Well, what was that? Well, I hadn't really paused long enough to learn from my mistakes. I was about to make the exact same mistakes coming into another year. That's one that's pretty benign. But one of them that may be more conflictual may be something that you, you would do around race, or you may have a conversation around race. Well, I, well, when George Floyd died, it was important to me. But further on down the year, in October and November, I got tired of hearing and talking about it, and it really wasn't as important to me because we have moved on in our news cycle. We start talking about the election, and the election took more influence and more time away from us then we start dealing with our racial issues in this country. And you can easily start slipping back into a way of thinking and behaving about people of difference and people of color because you have just been duped back into that same loop. Every four years there'll be another election. There'll always be those things. We, we could easily get drawn back into some old things. And here's the trickiest part of it all, and this is where my message is gonna go to. The challenge that I think I've had, and I've heard other people say, but they did it unknowingly, is that they want 2021 to be a cleaner year. Cleaner year, without all the issues. I want 2021 to be smoother. I don't want to have all the issues and the challenges of change that I had to do. Wearing my mask, not wearing my mask, keeping six feet apart, not being able to hang out with people, not going, I, you know, I, I want it to be smoother. I want 2021 to be clean. There's something to be said about people who desire things to be clean. I like a clean house. How many like a clean house? I like clean bedrooms. I like clean everything. I like, if it's clean, I'm loving it, right? Some of you want a clean life. How many of you ever had a clean life? I ain't never seen nobody with a clean life. It's always messy. It's always got some issues in it. It's always got some things that need to be fixed, some things that need to be taken out, some things that need to be repaired, some things that need to be maintained and maintenance. There is no such thing as a clean life. We do our very best with what we know with Scripture and what we may have been taught from our ancestors and what we may know to be just good working rules, but for the most part, there's always something that we're going to have to do and to work in and work out. That brings me to my text for today, Proverbs chapter 14 and verse 4. And it's just got one scripture. I got one scripture today. You know it's a good, a good morning if I got one scripture. And we're just going to work on this one scripture together. And I've preached this before, but I've done it differently, so I'm going to attack it a different way. And the text simply says this out of King James. It says, where no oxen are, the crib is clean. And I'm not talking about a baby crib, because you don't put oxen in the baby crib. <laughs> so when you see the word crib here, it just simply means like a manger, like a barn or a stable. So where no oxen are, the crib is clean. But much increase is by the strength of the ox. Elisa, just leave that text up. Just leave it up the entire time. We're just going to leave it up and just play with it. I want you to really think about this text because you could easily read past it. Any of you ever read a proverb a day, at one proverb a day every day? There's so much in there, so much content that it's good to pick up on stuff that you can't pick up on. But this one is easy to, to fly by because it's not connected to anything that's above or below. It's just kind of just sitting out there as a nugget of wisdom that's been put out there by the author. But we thought about 20, I thought about 2020 and I thought, Man, you know what? It's a messy year. It's complicated. A lot of stuff going on. I bet you a lot of people are ready to go into 2021 and just start over, clean the slate. Anybody ever done that? You're like, well, let's, just, let's just start over with a blank slate. Let's just wipe everything away, pretend like it never happened, and move on down the road. You may have said that in a relationship or two. Did you know what? Just forget about it. Let's just forget about it, and let's just move forward. Anybody ever done that? You know what I'm talking about. Yeah, anybody ever went for an amnesty? Uh, you went in and tried to just wipe away any issue that you had, criminal record. 
They, they, gave, they created a day of amnesty. Then you come in, and they, they see you there, then you pay a fine maybe, and they just wipe away all your criminal record for whatever it was that you owe. Maybe it was child support, whether it was like you had tickets, or whatever it is. They want just amnesty day. When we read this text, though, the scripture says that where no ox are, the crib is clean. This is in relation to an agricultural society that for those who were using the technologies of the time, they would have been in need of oxen and a crib. Oxen and a manger, oxen and a stall, oxen and a barn. They would have been in need of both things. Oxen in the day that we're talking about, when this text would have been written, were good for several things. They were good for, one, plowing fields, clearing fields, bringing in corn, and threshing wheat. They were good for those things. They were good for making sure that the product was produced and then delivered as needed. You could then put all the things that you had gathered in a cart and have an oxen pull it somewhere versus it being done by human power or human strength. The oxen was necessary if you were going to have large fields beyond the norm or you're going to be able to produce more than what you or your slaves or workers would be able to do in any particular season. You're going to need some help. And when we see the word here, oxen, I want you to think about the fact that it's not just one ox, but it's oxen. That it is a need for more than just you. It's a need for more than just one. That when we look at the text as a whole, I want you to think, me as an individual, I want you to think, my life, my story, my year, and the family and life that's going to come. All the things that are going to come. We're transitioning. This text is important for transition for anybody who's thinking that I can do it if everything stays clean. Oxen are symbolic of family. That it's going to take more than just you. Anybody try to do something by themselves? Ever? And the, the instructions. I, I've tried to hang a TV by myself before. Anybody ever done that? You try to, the, the instructions say it's going to take two people to carry the box. It's written on the side of it. But you don't have two people, nor do you want to wait for a second person, so you try to do it yourself. Uh, it's gonna, the gameplay, even when they put games together, you can't play this by yourself. It's going to take two, three, four, five people to play this. It is easy for us to be able to see instructions like this and try to ignore them and move on down the road. But when I think about what God is telling us for this coming year, is that we cannot think that you're going to be able to do it by yourself. You cannot pray that 2021 would be a cleaner year so that you could be able to move forward down the road by yourself without the help that has been given to you to make it through 2020. One of the reasons why we don't like 2020 is because it required us to be dependent upon other people. Oh, I don't really like that. So you mean I got to depend on, I got to depend on somebody else to wear their mask. I don't want to wear mine, but you wear yours. I got to be dependent on somebody else. I got to be dependent on someone else making sure that they do some things well so that I may be able to even frequent their establishment. I got to do some things well. Even as an employer, I have to change some rules of operation so that we can protect our employees. That's something I don't necessarily want to have to worry about. I don't want to worry about how you're going to operate remotely with your children. I don't want to have to think about those things. One of the big challenges of 2020, people are fatigued on. I've got a lot to think about, a whole bunch of other people other than myself. Other than mine, that creates anxiety, frustration in people. And you want to quickly get out of that. I'm tired of worrying about everybody else. And in a society that we live in that's focused on ourselves as much as we are, it makes even more stress and strain on us because I like to be that individual. I wear my flag. It's my flag. It's my constitution. It's my rules, my laws. I can do whatever I want. In the pursuit of happiness, I can do whatever I want to be happy. And sometimes being happy means that I focus on me only, and I don't care about what anybody else is going through. But what we realize is that we're more global than we've ever thought, that it's just not me and my neighborhood, but it's everywhere else. You see how the pandemic kind of spread. It was on the coast in these highly populated areas, and the people in the Midwest kind of still turned their nose up to it. and was like, well, you know, that's just them. It ain't real. It ain't us. It ain't going on. And all of a sudden, the pandemic started moving inside. And then those same people who in the cooling trucks was pulling up to New York City and now in L.A. and other places, they were the same ones who was like, well, it ain't a big deal. The same ones now got nursing homes with outbreaks and family members in hospitals. You got to be careful how you try to act 
when you feel like you don't need anybody else. 2020 is a great example of that, and this text is a great example, that it's going to take more than one ox to get your stuff done. It's going to take more than one. For you to do what God called you to do for the price that he's paid for your, your salvation, for the price he's paid for your freedom, for what it's going to take for the things he's purposed in your life, it's going to take more than you. It might take your brother. It might take your sister. It might take a cousin you don't like. It might take somebody, a coworker that you don't get down with. It might take you actually having to partner with somebody so you can't end up getting all the profit from a particular endeavor. You might have to do some things that you normally don't like to do for you to be able to, to perceive and receive exactly what God has for you in this coming year. Don't you think that this text is not for you? It's for everybody. Whether you feel like that you're focused on business or you're focused on family, you're focused on law, you're focused on health, you're focused on government, wherever it is that you feel like your focus is this morning, God's got a plan for you and this text is for you. Where there are no oxen, which means there has to be more than one. Where there is a need for relationship and camaraderie and there is a need for it in this coming year. You cannot get it done by yourself. The crib is clean. Anybody ever seen something in your life that was clean and shouldn't have been clean and it kind of made you nervous? Yeah, I've seen something like that before. Ever went to a garage and had somebody supposed to be working on, on a car? The, the, the garage was a little too clean. <laughs> it made me feel like that they didn't have enough work or they didn't know what they were doing. At some point in time, they weren't getting some stuff done. Perry, you ever been to a, a restaurant and the kitchen was a little too clean? It just, it just started struck, struck you as odd, like... They must not have any business. Or somebody must know something about them that I need to know. For them to be that clean, something's wrong. Someone who does yard work or construction, they're a little too clean to do that particular job. It'd be like me coming to mow your yard and I'm wearing a three-piece suit. That's the guy you don't want to hire. <laughs> do you understand what I'm saying? It's just a little too clean for the job that they are offering or say they can do. There are some jobs that you know just require there to be a little bit of dirt, a little bit of mess. And so this is how I get away with having a dirty desk. It's because it means that I'm busy. I'm busy. I got a lot of stuff going on. How many of you can say that? That's true, too, for you. Yeah, I know. I know. You got that one closet. It's super dirty. That's because you're busy and you can't get it done. Anybody got a junk drawer? Yeah, you got something hidden somewhere that's not completely, it's not completely organized. Here's, here's why I'm saying this. If you think you're going to be able to get the, what God has for you, but you want it to always be clean, you're going to have problems. You're going to have problems. The whole, for, first half of the entire text just simply says that the crib is clean where there's no oxen, and then we know that from what we've heard that the oxen were necessary to do anything in agricultural society, that oxen were necessary. It, it was part of efficiency and ease that you would have something this huge, a beast this capable, but you wouldn't have them in the crib is an issue. Why is that? Because oxen are also symbolic of tools. That, uh, there's some tools that you can winterize and put away, and you don't ever have to see them again until the next season. But oxen are unique because they're living. I cannot treat them that way. Even when I don't need them, I have to feed them. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Even when you don't need something, this is what God is saying to me to tell you, that there are oxen, there are things in your life that even though you feel like I don't need them, for them to be available for you, when their strength to be available for you, when the time comes, you have to continue to maintain and feed them. They may not be plowing now. The weather's cold. The ground's too hard. But if you don't feed those oxen every day and clean the crib, guess what? The con when the time comes for you to be able to get back in the flow of the season, you won't be able to call upon them because they won't be there. Now, this is important because some of you got relationships like this. You try to win or rise a relationship. I'm just going to go through the motions, put it around like it's an inanimate object. I won't mess with it. I won't do anything of maintenance on it. And then when I call or ring the bell or make the tap on the shoulder, I expect that relationship to all of a sudden produce like it used to. That's a dangerous place to be. I love the fact that the Lord used oxen here because he could have easily said something about a plow being in the crib or a plow being in a shed. But he uses a live animal because the live animal requires an ongoing relationship and maintenance that they have to be fed every day. Just ask anyone who grew up in a farming community. 
You don't, you don't get days off. Because livestock don't take days off. Which means you have to always be ready and your day, your year has to be shaped around the fact that you're going to have to feed and take care of those animals. And now we see not only an animal that is, can be ate at some point in time, but this animal then is used for work to be done in this particular field. It's an economic move. We see this economy being played out, that God is saying that the, for, your, for the economy to work, not just the financial or fiduciary economy, but for the economy of relationship to work, there has to be a little bit of mess. <laughs> I know this is going to mess you up. This is what makes 2020 so beautiful. It, it, it has a, a, the type of mess that's necessary, and if we look at it close enough, it's the type of mess that helps produce other things in our life. If without the mess, there's some things that you won't get done in your life. How many, how many of you just sometimes you can't even sit down unless the things are all clean and organized? Not everybody's like this, because I, I know you. Not everybody's like this. I see you take Facebook pictures in your house and just tore up. So I know, that, I know everybody ain't like this. I know everybody ain't like this. What I'm saying is that you got a, you got a real need that you can't just sit down and let some things ride. You got to always make sure that's done before you can really relax. For some of us, they, they, they're okay with a certain level of mess. But then what God has to do when he wants to deal with the entire people, he's got to raise a level of mess for everybody. So that everybody, the group is, is frustrated enough to make progress and then chip in and say, we got to get this fixed. 2020 is that type of elevation of the tide rising and all the boats rise and everybody got to do something about it. It's that type, of, that type of elevated issue that causes everybody to say, okay, what are we going to do versus what are you going to do? My hope is that when we see this, that we will see that God has given us, yes, oxen, and he has given us a crib. He has given it to us in the form of issues and challenges, but they always then come about so that we would be the better and we would develop beyond what we would have had we not had the mess. You cannot have a choreless existence. A choreless existence is a fruitless existence. Do you hear what I'm saying? If you don't have chores, then what are you really producing? Now, this matters to some of you because you're sitting there thinking like, Pastor, what are you talking about chores? Well, we're talking about saying that if there's oxen and there's a crib that's clean, that means that, listen, I don't have to do chores. I like ease. It's the temptation of ease. It's the temptation that the enemy will offer for you. You know what? Man, don't even forget the oxen. Don't even put them in there because you know what? If we don't have them in there, then guess what? We don't have to clean up. Some of you don't understand what this means. It means the same thing for you. You want a husband, you want a wife, but you realize that there's extra work that comes when you have those things. Yeah, it does. There's work. You want a degree. There's extra work that comes with that. You want a promotion. There's extra work that comes with that. You want to be recognized for your gifts and your ability. There's extra work that comes with that. You want people to really take full advantage of your, your repertoire, what you bring to any particular organization or agency. I want people to really realize that I'm a great leader. Well, guess what? There's extra work with that. And sometimes when we start thinking about the level of work that's associated with it, we don't realize that God has something beautiful for us in manure. Yeah, manure isn't good to those who feel like that's all I have to do is the chore of cleaning it up. I feed them, and they poop. I feed it, and I poop. It seems like if I quit feeding it, then the poop will quit coming. But can I tell you, if you quit feeding it, the poop will quit coming, but also the fruit will quit coming as well. That they both have a place, and you won't be able to get what you think that's going to be fruitful in 2021 if you want to completely silence and get away from everything that happened in 2020. 2019 won't make 2021, but 2020 will make 2021 what it is because you have the opportunity to say, my crib was dirty. That means that work was getting done. I got unfinished projects. I got things I need to do, things that are calling me. There's some things that require my attention and my, my focus, and that's okay because that simply means that I am going to take full advantage of the mess that was 2020. 
I can't leave it by itself. I got to engage it. You cannot allow your life to be such leisurely that you want choreless existence. I don't want to have to do that. I don't want to have to worry about that. How many of you got kids? You know they don't like doing chores. I mean, it, it's a sign where the, really of where their maturity is at. When you have to quit telling them to take the trash out, you, you, you're working on something, and they're developing. When you have to quit telling them to clean the room, they're developing. When you have to quit telling them to take the dog out, they're developing. They're moving. They're moving. If i got to keep telling them, then they're still in the place of immaturity. But at some point in time, you'll see them develop and move on to some things to where the chores really aren't that bad. They realize that it's a part of the benefit of being a part of this house. It's a part of the benefit of being part of this community. It's like you have an employee. If you have to keep telling them to clean this or to do this with the client or do this with the customer or treat customers like this, then they really still at the same time don't see the benefit of the full benefit of actually having a job or being employed, which leads to firing sometimes. I know I'm helping somebody out. You're wondering, like, how is he going this way? Because they don't think, they think the mess is really an issue. I wish these people wouldn't be so messy. I wouldn't have to clean up after them. Well, let me just tell you this. If there wasn't a mess, you wouldn't have a job. If there wasn't kids who, who needed teaching, you wouldn't have a job. If there wasn't people who needed loans, you wouldn't have a job. If there weren't people who need it, who need it, who need it, then you wouldn't have a job. So someone else's mess is what? An opportunity for you. But we want what? A toilet existence. I don't want to have to do any of that. Well, you don't want to eat. The scripture says that they don't, if you don't work, you don't eat. I don't want any chores. I don't want to have to do anything to keep this relationship afloat. I just wish it autopilot. It would auto clean itself. You know, here's, here's the problem. We want to get away from 2020 so that we could get into 2021 so some things could just go back to normal and they could go back on autopilot for us. Not so fast. The beauty of 2020 is that there's a mess and there then gives you opportunity for your purpose to be seen. I was busy after George Floyd's passing, but it was just opportunity for my gifts to be seen. I could have easily said no to a whole bunch of things that came up right after that. Don't want to talk to nobody. Don't want to see nobody else. I don't care. It's just me. I'm turning my phone off, turning my email off. I'm just going to sit still. I'm just going to relax because it's take my leave. It's just me. I don't want to deal with this mess. No. There's an opportunity for me to get engaged and get involved. It had to deal with my purpose. Now, many of you or listen to this, and you're saying that, well, to get to the increase part, Pastor, because I want to talk about the increase. I understand you want to talk about increase. But increase does not come if you won't deal with messes. It cannot come. If you're unwilling to deal with the mess the ox creates, you cannot have increase. It's a gift. The ox is a gift. The ox is a, is a beautiful beast, big beast, strong beast, a beast of burden, a beast of power, a beast for pulling and not pulling. A, put, a piece of pulling and not pushing. You hear what I'm saying? That you have to be willing to move down the road with this thing and know that there are going to be mistakes. I cannot expect a clean existence and still be in God's will. You cannot. The enemy will tell you this. If you were doing this right, you wouldn't have as many problems. If you were doing this right, you wouldn't have the challenges you have with them. And they wouldn't have the challenges you have with, your, with, with us. If we were doing this right, we wouldn't have conflicts between red and blue. If we were doing this right, there wouldn't be any issue between black and white, or white and brown, or who whatever the color that you want to add in there. It, if we were doing this right, there won't be any issues at all. Can I tell you that's such a lie from the enemy? It, it's such a lie because it, it, it just... It minimalizes the complexity of us being able to do life together. There's going to be a mess. And any time you're walking around in an, in an environment where there's no mess, I can tell you you're not doing nothing. We all get along. We never have any issues. We never argue. We never disagree. We never fight. There's never an issue with, of, 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 of differing opinions. There's not a, well, I'm telling you, there's an issue. There's a bigger issue for those of you who can say that. There's a bigger issue because somebody's lying. That's just the truth. I would rather you say, this is going to be tough. This is going to be complicated. This is going to be challenging. We're going to have to do some work. Not everybody's going to get their way. 
Some people are going to have to realize their losses before they move forward and understand that we're all going to lose something if we're going to move forward together. This isn't going to be one of those things that we're all going to be treated equally because there's some people who are going to have to give more for us all to make progress in this area. That's tough conversations that we need to have, but it is symbolic of what we need to continue to carry on with us as we move forward from 2020. We need to realize that we have been given a gift, the gift of saying that we can work together, we can think about somebody else. It's, it's okay for us to realize that we are all connected, that I'm, I, even though I'm a Midwesterner, I'm just as human as the people who live on the East Coast and the West Coast. And, and I, I get sick just like the people in Brazil get sick. I get sick like they get sick in Africa. Uh, somehow we get to a point to where we, we think that we're sometimes superior genetically, that COVID can't mess with us, or that, you know what, we can't hurt like they hurt. Let me just tell you this. If bombs go off like they did in, in the city, what was it, Nashville? In Nashville on Christmas morning, it, it happens to us like it happens to people over in, in Beirut. It happens to us like it happens to people in all parts of the world, the globe. There's crazy folks out there in, in, in the United States, like there's crazy folks in China. There's crazy folks everywhere. So you can't sit around and act like you're superior or better than. It's a mess. And what I'm trying to tell you is this, that we need to be willing and able to understand that I'm going in knowing that I'm going to have to get my hands dirty. Who wants to get their hands dirty? You don't have to get your hands dirty. You got your hands dirty, you don't have to keep them dirty. Because what God's calling us to do, and all the references we see in the text and in Scripture, are always about getting things done, sowing and reaping and going in and laboring and laborers in the field. The harvest is plenteous, but the laborers are few. None of that stuff talks about ease. None of it is leisure. None of it is storing up your, your wealth and your riches for retirement. None of that language is in the scripture at all. All we see is people who God has called to be laborers and workers and keeping sheep. And he, you see the same, type of, the same type of pattern going on and on. It's talking about what? Getting dirty. How can you get with God if you won't get dirty? You won't get messy. Or you're, you're too busy trying to wipe the stench of the sheep off so that you can be in the palace. You're too busy trying to do those things. And, and that's not what God David promoted. So you feel like that you could separate yourself from that so that you could be seen in a better light. And all the while, you're sabotaging your own success because you won't do the dirty stuff because you think it's beneath you. Ease, pleasure. I don't want to have to work that hard to keep the marriage. I don't want to have to work that hard to to be a good example on my job. I don't want to have to work that hard to, to model Christian beliefs and values when I'm with my family that believes otherwise. I don't want to have to work that hard to learn this new language of love that God is challenging me to learn. I wish I could do it a little bit easier. So therefore, if I could just keep this crib clean. There's frustration that people have when they have clean cribs. Frustrated people Clean crib, but no fruit. That's the challenge that we're facing today. That's what we're facing today is that there's people who have the satisfaction of saying, well, look how clean this is, but their lives are empty nonetheless. You don't want to live a, lo a solitary life. You don't want to do it. And here's the thing that you need to know about oxen is that their strength is best seen when they're moving forward. Their strength is best seen moving forward, not backpedaling, not even standing still. They look good standing still because they're muscular, but you really don't get a chance to really see what all that muscle can do until they start moving forward. And I think that's exactly where God wants us to be thinking about as we move into this year, is that we're moving forward. Not so much the language I can't wait to get back to. The ox's strength really is not seen if he's backpedaling. The ox's strength is not seen as well in those types of movements. The best we can see from an ox is when they choose to move forward. And very few things can stop an ox when they want to move forward. Do you know what I'm talking about? I don't know about you, but I'm not going to get in front of one and be like, oh, slow down, slow down. You know, it, it's, that's not the case here. 
And God is telling us that what I have given you, you need to move forward on. The gifts, abilities, purpose, the calling, whatever it is I've given, you need to move forward on it. Stop thinking backwards because your true ability will not be seen. Your strength of increase will not really be realized if you think negative or you think backwards. But it's in the forward momentum and the forward movement that we see that Christians and other believers ex ex exude the best and the greatest that we have to offer. Our strength is at its best when we move forward through adversity. Not from it, do you hear what I'm saying? But through it. The difference from from it to through it is that I'm running from it. Through it says, I understand it's a necessity, I, I choose to go through it. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. I'm going through it. I'm not running from it. And matter of fact, the scripture does say, yea, though I run through the valley. It said, yea, though I walk through the valley. There's a level of confidence and, and a level of resiliency that we see that has been given to us by our creator. That says the very best strength that I have is when I'm willing to plow through some things and not go around it. I choose to go through it. I choose to show my strength by clearing the path and making roads. Even so, in the New Testament, the scripture says that, that we should be careful about people who choose to, to do ministry who put their hand to the plow and look back because we are going forward and not backwards. The desire for us to run away from discomfort is so strong. And I get it. I'm not saying that to be unwise. I'm not saying to be just, you know, cruising for a bruising, as some would say. I'm not telling you to go out and just, just seek pain. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is that there are some things that God has uniquely gifted us to do so that he could take that mess and propel us and move us forward. And I know many of you have already, you've heard this, 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 this story. I'm going to say it so you can finally say it, he takes my mess and make it a message. It, everybody says that, right? But what I'm really wanting us to really think about is that this is an opportunity. 2021 has given us the gift of the mess. And really what we have to do is think about this. What will be produced from it? So my mind has been thinking on this. I've been, I've been contemplating on what will 2020 produce for me in 2021 that had I not been through that, I would not be able to receive what I'm going to receive in the coming year. You may need to play that game in your own mind. Because I guarantee you that when this is starting to wane and us, our connections are getting easier to come together in groups, there are going to be some winners and there are going to be some losers. That's just the way it is. There are going to be some people who took advantage of the stock market, they're going to win. There are going to be some people who didn't, they're going to lose. There are going to be some people who took advantage of getting engaged with their children's education, and there are going to be some who didn't. There are going to be some who chose to really strengthen that marriage that showed all kinds of cracks and weaknesses because they were spending so much time together, they didn't realize they were really needing help. There are going to be some who win, and there are going to be some who go back to normal and they're going to lose. There are going to be some who felt like they didn't really need to attend church, and they're going to they're gonna be some who says, you know what, I see the value now of being in the room. And they're going to be some who show up and they're going to be in the room. They're going to win. And they're going to be some who says, you know what? I was all right. I'd rather just do it remotely. They're going to be some who lose. There are going to be some people who said, you know what? I can see that there are so many now new need, a new need for new technologies and new opportunities that I have entered an entire new field of belonging and, and operating. This is a great opportunity and season for me. And there are going to be some who just talk about it over drinks over, over the table with friends. Oh, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this. And there are going to be some who never do anything and they're going to lose on the other side of it. Yeah. There's, gonna, there's always somebody who can make money in a bull market or a bear market. Yeah. There's people who, who can understand the ebbs and flows. And this has been an opportunity and a blessing for some of us to recalibrate, mm -hmm. to reinvent, to redeploy, to be different to change. This has been one of the great things that I could see that I told you at the beginning when this was all happening. I told you that God was giving us an opportunity to write a blank check. 
whatever it is that you wanted to try and you wanted to do, the, the mess was going to give you an opportunity to not have to play by the old rules. The mess was going to be so great that it was going to require a whole new way of doing things, a whole new way of thinking, that if you wanted to be adventurous, if you wanted to be experiential, if you wanted to be experimental, if you wanted to try something different, this was going to be the perfect environment for you to step out, and people won't nearly look at you as wrong for failing because they realize that this is a whole new era, a whole new season. You could have been masked and all that. There's going to be some of you who said, you know what, I thought about really putting more emphasis in, and focus on this and that, but I just didn't. Some of your couches are all wore out because you've still been sitting in the same place. You don't have your full Netflix. You don't watch every Netflix show you can watch. You don't watch it. You don't got HBO Max, you don't got Hulu, you got Prime, you got everything. You, you even bootleg and stuff. You got everything. You don't, you don't watch everything that there is to watch. You've seen it. When are you going to stop hoping that this could be choreless? When are you going to move from choreless to fruitful? When are you going to realize that this mess is an opportunity for you to come out on the side? flowing in things that you could have only gotten because of 2020. You know how important family is now because you've been challenged with whether or not you're going to even meet. You understand that now. Don't forget it. Don't forget how this mess has contrasted some things and made it very apparent what you really needed most. Some of you lost loved ones. Just lost them because that's just the natural flow of life, and some of you lost them because of COVID. Whatever it is, you realize the value of some things that we could easily take for granted. Some of you are afraid of being alone. You had never really known it. But this isolation has really elevated the fact that hey, you don't do well when you're by yourself. You got to always have something on, something to drown out the silence because the silence is too much, because it makes you think about all the things that you don't want to think about, you haven't done the work. 2020 is an opportunity for you to get that right. It's a mess, it is, yeah. But you can get that right. Counseling, pastoral otherwise, financial gain, some of you realize that you were spending too much. And all of a sudden you realize there's money in your bank account. Where did this money come from? Well, you're not out just nickel and diamond and running to Quick Trip and eating and drinking at Starbucks and all that other stuff. All of a sudden, you got money in your account. Wow, I didn't even know I could really even make my bills. This whole time, I thought I was underpaid. No, you just overspend. A great opportunity for you. Don't you, don't you think that this mess is that you some run through it. No, 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 don't run. Don't run from it. Understand that God wants us to go through it because on the other side of it, we're the better. Even so much so as I transition, the disciples thought Jesus and the things that happened during the Passover week was a mess too. How could this be? He's a Savior. We've seen him do great miracles. We knew that he was going to come and liberate us from our oppressors, the Romans. This isn't nearly as clean as I thought it was going to go. He comes in riding on a donkey and they're singing Hosanna, and then all of a sudden before it's all over with, they're shouting Barabbas. How is it that our Savior, our Christ, has been crucified and buried? This is a mess. Yeah. Yeah. Looks like that, doesn't it? And even for Christ, as his disciples who were closest to him, hid and cowered in rooms and buildings all over, saying, what will we do now that they've killed Jesus? It looked like a mess. What good could come from this? He was wrongly accused. He was beat up. He was... He lied on, they plucked his beard, they, 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 they whipped him with a cat of nine tails, his flesh was tore open. What, what good is this? They pierced him in his side. What, what could have happened good from this? 
This doesn't make sense. This is too much of a mess. And all the while we see this mess that we have the privilege and benefit of looking from it from 2,000 years, we can see that ultimately it was God's plan for his son to go through that mess so that he might then produce the freedom and the righteousness that we all could share in and partake in. Your salvation, the whole process of it looked like a mess. If you go through his lineage, all the way down to his life, nothing good can come from Nazareth. When you see him hiding from the king, Agrippa, uh, King uh, Herod, all the way from Egypt, all the way back in, silent years, family, ostracization by the, the government and those who were in political power and, and theolo uh, theological centers, they didn't like him. It looked like a mess. And all of a sudden, from that mess, God brings a Savior, and His glory is shown. That's exactly what God does even now from 2020, if you will allow Him to. Some of you have lost things, lost jobs, lost loved ones. Listen, it looks like a mess, but allow God to do what He's going to do in it. Can He resurrect something in your life, in your situation? If He did it when He, did his, when he brought His Son into the world to rescue humanity, then He also has reserved the right to do the exact same pattern because the enemy doesn't like to see that type of pattern. He realizes that, listen, if I show it to be a mess, the enemy will think he's won. But the scripture says that Jesus defeated the enemy openly. You need to see this, and your victory will be the same, that you will defeat all those things that look to overtake you and defeat you, you will defeat them openly. If God can use a mess to disguise his champion, then why can't he use it for you? Remember, Jesus was born where? In a crib, in a manger. Didn't look like much then. Turned out to be a whole lot on the back end. 2020 may not look like much, but it turned out to be a whole bunch on the back end. You don't even know it. You won't know it until you get down the road and you realize that I learned that back there in what I thought was a mistake and a mess. I learned that in a pandemic. I learned that when I was isolated. I learned that back then. It'll prove itself beneficial for us as we move down the road. Those of you who are listening to me online, what are you learning? What is it that God is saying to you now? What is he doing in such a a really, I think, a covert way by disguising all the things he's teaching you in a mess. <laughs> if you're trying to make your life choreless, let me caution you. It's not going to produce what you think it's going to produce in your life. If you're always trying to get out of work, let me caution you. I'm, I'm trying to take the path of least resistance. Let me, let me caution you. That's not what God is calling us to do. I'm grateful for you. I'm glad you went through 2020. But perhaps 2021 holds even more work. I don't want you to be afraid or you to run from it or you to be shy or you to be fearful or you to think I'm going to run out of gas or steam. His grace is sufficient for you as it is for me. Here's what I want you to do. I normally pray for salvations right now, and I normally do that every Sunday. I'm not going to do it this Sunday. What I'm going to do is I'm going to pray for those of you who are in this process. You're in transition. And I know that the calendar in itself doesn't, doesn't determine what God's going to do. Our calendar doesn't determine God's calendar. But nonetheless, we're coming into a new year. And I want us to be aware and alert to what God really wants from us in this hour. Don't you run from the mess. I want you to see the scripture where no ox are, the crib is clean. But much increase is by strength of the ox. Your purpose, your giftings, your ability. Some things about you that are good, but sometimes they're overplayed. They become weaknesses. Those are all oxes. You're a hard worker, but you don't know how to turn the motor off. You're tough, resilient, 
you don't mind speaking truth to power, but sometimes you, you talk out of turn, you talk too much, and it becomes a hindrance from you. That's an ox. It, it creates a little bit of poop and a little bit of manure in a way. It does not mean that we don't, we don't use it, we don't play with it, we don't move forward with it, but we just have to realize our role in it. And the crib is just a bigger arc of life, the life that we choose to share with each other and share with loved ones. I want us to play to our full. I want our strength to be seen. I want your strength to be seen. And there is no need for strength unless there's adversity. That's just the truth of it. So when we see this huge animal, we realize that God is saying that I've, I've, I've given you this picture of wisdom, choosing these particular items, the crib and the ox, because the ox is a huge beast, and it says, yes, there's a lot of adversity that's to come. There's a lot of ground to hoe, a lot of ground to prepare, a lot of fruit and seed that's been sown that we have to bring in. And that requires you. The harvest is plenteous, but the laborers are few. I'm praying for you. I'm praying that you would allow God to use your gifts in this season. That on the backdrop of 2020, your light would shine even brighter. That your resilience, your tenacity, your commitment to God's word and his truth would be seen and echoed again and again and again. Let your life be that, like a city on a hill that's not hid. Let it be that people, when they look up, they can see you shining, even the more bright, even as the days get darker. My hope is that you would do that because that's what God calls us to do. More importantly, I pray that you're refreshed by the idea that God has been intentional in what he's doing now in this hour. And that as he is intentional, then we realize that we have the purposeful existence of saying that I will do what God has called me to do. Father, you know those who are here. You know better than I know. You know those who are secret watchers of Mending Place Online. And you know those who are openly watching. Regardless of where they are and what they're doing and why they're doing it that way, I believe that you gave me this message for them, even in prayer. One verse that I pray that they would commit to memory. Where no oxen are, the crib is clean, but much increases by the strength of the ox. That they would take this verse and, and just roll it over again and again in their heart and their mind. That you would then be able to speak to them through it, far beyond what I've been able to say in the 45 minutes I've been here with them. May your will be seen and evident, your strength be seen in them as they choose to move forward as they go through and not run from. I pray your blessing be upon them. The next time they see work, things that look like a mess, things that look like, oh my goodness, if I didn't have this, then I wouldn't have had to do this, that they would have a quick reshaping of their mind and their focus and see the benefit of having to do some things because they have some fruit and some other things produced in their life. That's my hope. I pray your blessing be upon us. I can't do anything other than saying, God, thank you for what you've brought us through. Thank you for where you're leading us into. And you never take us through anything that doesn't shape us for the better or for what we're going into. I leave 2020 rejoicing, grateful for how your hand has protected and kept, grateful for how you provided, Grateful that I have an opportunity to see 2021. I, I thank you, God, for 2020. That allows me to receive what you have for me in 2021. I don't curse what I've been through. I know that it shaped me for what you're taking me to. I pray your blessing upon it now. Thank you for everybody who's now in the, under the sound of my voice who's saying, I don't know what 2021 has to offer, but God, I'm grateful for what 2020 has been. I will not leave this year without giving you praise. I will not leave this year without giving you a sacrifice of praise. I will not leave this year without saying, God, if you had not been for me, then I don't know exactly what would have happened. But greater is he that's within me than he is in the world. Thank you so much for how you're doing it. Thank you so much for what you're teaching me along the way. And I'll gladly, gladly go into 2021 believing that there's going to be messes, and I won't run from them. I'll run to them. May your blessings be thick upon us. And may your name be echoed 
and heralded from all of our acts. In Jesus' name, amen.